and um, there you go. Um, welcome to tonight's Petaluma Riverside Chat. Um, tonight we are joined with co-host Chaos Rowing Club Captain Felix Mullabach, who has generously arranged an exceptional panel discussion on rhythm or how to be fast through the middle 500. From the perspective of our three guests, rowing Australia senior coach Andrew Randall, and he's logging in from Australia. Internationally renowned applied sports biomechanist, Connie Draper, logging in from Germany, right, Connie, I believe? Right now, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and professional athlete and gold medalist, Olivia Coffey, logging in from Chula Vista, California. Um, before we get into this panel discussion, just a brief blurb about these chats and our upcoming schedule. Uh, these Petaluma River Tide chats began in July of last year as a venue to enhance viewers' knowledge of rowing and the Petaluma River watershed and the ongoings of the greater Petaluma River community. Um, the Petaluma Riverside chat video recordings will be accessible to the public via the Petaluma Riverside chat YouTube channel. And I'll go ahead and put that link in the Zoom chat in just a sec. And um, since the recording of this chat will be made public, if you do not wish to be recorded, you can watch live with your video and microphone off. Um, and if you'd like to be notified of future chats, please email me and I'll put my email address in the Zoom chat as well. Um, regarding the upcoming chat schedule, and I'm just gonna take a pause here and admit a couple people. There we go. Um, our next chat will be on Wednesday, July 20th at 5 p.m. with U.S. National Team member Kendall Chase. Jan January. 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 Oh, I thought you said January 20th. Yeah, you said July. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Right. Right. <laughs> January 20th at 5 p.m. with U.S. National Team member Kendall Chase and some of her crew logging in from their Chula Vista training bubble, where Olivia is calling in from tonight. Um, in early February, former Olympian Lindsay Shoup will join us for possibly two sessions, one to discuss her new book, Better Late Than Never, Believing It's Possible, and another to focus on movements, warm-up techniques, etc., to enhance our rowing as masters. Um, other confirmed but yet to be scheduled chats will be with the Delta Rowing Center founders and coaches Pat Tyrone and Bob O'Brandy to share their vision of inclusivity, rowing for every body and the Petaluma Small Craft Center to share their vision for the center, uh, Sage Roundtree on yoga for athletes, Dana Riggs on the Petaluma River fish and wildlife, and Friends of the River Executive Director Stephanie Bastion will inform us about what they have going on there. And lastly, so far anyway, SSU Professor Nicole Myers on the geologic origins and evolution of the Petaluma watershed. Um, feel free to contact me for more details and suggestions for possible topics and speakers for this venue. We also have some excellent um, past sessions that you'll find on the Petaluma Riverside Chat YouTube channel, if you'd like. Um, take a moment at this time, if you feel like it, to type into the chat the group you're affiliated with and your location, just so that people can kind of see the community that they're with tonight. Um, during our time with the panelists, please type your questions into the chat so that Felix and I can refer to them during the discussion and the Q&A following. Um, please join me in welcoming my co-host Felix Mullabach and our three panelists, Connie Draper, Olivia Coffey, and Andrew Randall. Welcome and thank you all for joining us. Very excited to have you all here to discuss rhythm. Um, due to our time constraints and our desire to jump right into this very interesting topic, Felix will do a brief introduction of our guest panelists and then go from there. Thanks. You're good to go, Felix. Yeah, yeah, I'm just not finding what I'm supposed to find. That's the problem. Um, what the fuck? Okay, good. Um, okay. Do you see it? Yes. Okay. Um, today is Epiphany, and um, at least in the German mythology, you know, on the, on the Epiphany, three wise men come and bring presents. And uh, in our case now, with gender equality, we have uh, two wise women and one wise man <laughs> bringing, us, <laughs> bringing us a present today. And I've been really looking forward uh, to this event. Um, all three are here because 
they have one unique um, uh, quality in common. They're ex exceptionally skilled in explaining different difficult things in an easy way so that normal people like I can understand it. And uh, the subject we covered today can be extremely technical. And, and it was for me, it was really important to have people who can actually explain what is going on. And um, my experience with all three of them is that, um, you know, no question too dull to ask for them to answer and they will always answer it. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat, put it in the Q&A and we'll, we'll get to it. Um, so brief introduction, Olivia Coffey, um, the world drawing website is down, but you have four world championships. Is that correct? No, yeah. it's just three. <laughs> yeah, but you have one U23 too, don't you? Okay, yeah, if you count that, yeah. Okay, yes, four. okay, <laughs> good. And um, she has um, one thing that really impresses me. She has a World Cup where she won two gold medals in the eight and in the four on basically the same day. So that's um, extremely impressive. Um, Olivia is a full-blooded athlete and has an MBA. And while she got her MBA in uh, Cambridge, she stroked the, Com the Cambridge 8 to a commanding win over Oxford in the boat race. And since our members are from the Oxford side, of course, they didn't like that, but it was really, really, really impressive. And just to, to show the commitment of Olivia to practicing. So she comes home and she tells her fiance, by the way, I'm not practicing Saturday. Let's go and get married. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, it's only two days to plan. It was super simple. <laughs> so that's, uh, and I wanted to do a Muppet Show quote here, but my wife told me not to do it. Um, so um, Andrew Randall is here um, because he is, coach through and through. So I met him where he invited me to a Sunday afternoon stroll up a mountain that turned out to into a very, very painful lesson uh, in race planning. And I, of course, failed miserably. So Andy never stops coaching, never. And he has coached on all levels from boys to high schools to university, U23, development pass and currently coaches um, the national team um, um, in Australia. He has won uh, pretty much every medal there is to win, um, notably two Handley wins with uh, two different boys schools and um, because he also uh, was in the US um, with his teams, he also has a head of the Charles win. And um, for me, he is here today because in the Australian system, he always gets the development team. So he is charged at the beginning of the season is to get literally get the B team together. And then he goes to the world championships with them. And for the last two world championships, they actually have beat um, the US men's team. So um, to me, that's just um impressive and it shows how how the skill of of andy is to bring teams together and that's what we as masters of course face a lot this challenge connie draper is um scientist through and through i mean master thesis phd thesis on the subject her phd thesis was on the how to make a woman 1x fast and she never stops working. As you heard, it's two o'clock in the morning in Germany right now, and she is here with us. She is cosmopolitan. I mean, if you'll try to figure out where she actually lives, it's almost impossible. And of course, what makes us envious is she's also in the uh, FISA World Rowing Technical and, and Equipment Commission. So she gets to try all the new toys. Um, and rumor has it that she currently um, gets feedback information about the new comp plate. So, Rene, if you're on, if you want to ask information about it, I mean, she, uh, Connie, would be the person to ask. What I have learned is that Connie isn't driven by the numbers. She also has a perfect eye. So she can sit in the coach launch, 
look at the data and look at the rover and then see that there's something wrong with the measurement. And that to me is, is a, a unique skill because you know all the other people I know, they are so focused on the numbers that they sometimes forget um, the, the, the rower, the looking at the rower and what the rower does. So all of three of them are brain powers and um, they are here to tell us normal mortals about rhythm. And now I have been looking at definitions for rhythm and I found one from Kath Granger where she describes the challenge they faced um, for the Sydney Four, which then turned out to be the first women's um, me Olympic medal for British rowing. And she said, we had to hit the rhythm. It is crucial in rowing, allowing you to apply maximum power and speed while not interrupting the flow of the boat or the water and allowing as much recovery as possible between each explosive stroke. And of course, that's what we all dream about. And my friend Peter Bohr, um, also a Brit, calls it tapping it along. And when you sit in a quad with him, he's 78 years old, and he strokes, it feels effortless. And he calls it, we only have to bring the boat up to speed, and then we just have to put the minimum into the system to getting it going. Now, Andy Tricks Hodge, um, in uh, his interviews, always explains it the same way, that when the boat has rhythm, it's seemingly effortless speed. And he says it's the easiest race we ever won. So he refers to the one where he almost had to give up rowing because of health problems. He came back, he didn't make it to stroke seat. He was in the engine room. They had another allegedly weak rower in bow and they still won a gold medal. And he says it for all of them, it, it was the easiest race they ever raced. And um, I think Robin Williams, um, who now is back into GB rowing coaching, he has said about the rhythm, that the rhythm is generated and defined. You don't stumble across it. And that's why we are here. That's why we brought in the experts. I hope they can explain us um, how we can generate and define rhythm. So let's start with Olivia. I mean, Olivia, you tell us. I mean, this is about you. How did you get here? Why are you in the outside lane? So this is the 2015 World Championship in Ecbelet, France. Um, we were in the outside lane because uh, based on the previous races, we were one of the slowest boats coming into the final. Um, and I mean, I don't know how much detail you want me to get into it now, but we were a really, uh, a relatively new lineup. Um, mm -hmm. We made switches maybe two weeks before race race and time. You, and you were the alternate, correct? I mean, you yeah, were... yeah. So I wasn't supposed to be in the quad until maybe um, four weeks before we left for the World Championships, and then even then, our lineup was different up until we were at a pre World Camp, I think, in Italy. Right. Um, and I think a really important thing to remember about uh, rhythm is it sometimes it just doesn't come naturally. And I can say with confidence that this boat was not fast uh, until we got to the world championships. And I think um, for rowers, that's really frustrating uh, because you feel like you're putting in all the right, you know, the right ingredients, the effort, you know, the time, the commitment, you think you have the right athletes and it's just not going. And then sometimes it just takes, it takes time together in the boat and also takes um, a high stakes situation to kind of rise to the occasion. And that's kind of what happened for us in that final. Um, we were super slow off the start, which is why we weren't winning in the preliminary races. And so we just fixed that one aspect and we had very good base speed because um, like you said, there's that rhythm that kind of carries you through the middle. Um, so that's, I think, why we were able to win that race. Um, but I guess a lot of people didn't really see it coming. So that was fun. <laughs> so how, I mean, you know, from us as the outsider, how, how did you get from outsider to stroke, you know, to alternate and then stroke and actually also steering the boat? So you had, you know, you had to do two things at the time. So how, how you know, did you try for different lineups or was it clear that you would be in stroke? 
Uh, no, previously I had been in um, three C and the bow had been in stroke. Um, that didn't work. And they switched the two of us. That didn't work. We finally put Megan Calmo in a three C and it just took off. And, you know, a big aspect for me uh, with rhythm, especially consistently stroking boats is feeling like um, the people behind me are moving with me. And to me, that feels like uh, no resistance at any point in the stroke. And so when Calma got right behind me, it, there was no resistance on the drive and the recovery. And that's when I have a good sensation of the fact, you know, we're doing the right things. Um, and once you have that as a rower, uh, you can go as fast as you want. It's just how much, how much you can put behind the blade. Yeah, because, you know, in another interview, I saw that you had issues with the start. So, but, you know, here in the final, actually, you weren't that far behind. I mean, you know, if you look here, it's... Yeah, so we were confident with our base speed. And I would say a day or two before this, all we did was starts. And when you go to a world championship and you've never done a start in a lineup and you've done very few starts in a quad, it makes a big difference uh, just getting more practice in. And I would say that's pretty standard for the U.S. team is... Uh, we rarely do stuff at rate before races, and when we do, it's uh, never focused on the start. So a lot of times you'll see us down off the start, um, but kind of much faster through the middle of the race. And I think that's that's you know pretty typical for an American crew. And then, um, so um, so just that everybody knows the the. The favorites for this race were Germany and Australia. They were um, the, supposed to win. Germany set the world best time the year before. They went on to actually then win the Olympics. So that was the boat to um, look for. And at 500 meters, you were half or 0.6 seconds behind them. Were, were you surprised to be that close? Or I mean, what do you think at that? Time. To be honest, I wasn't really looking. I, we had the Dutch right next to us, so I could only tell how we were doing versus them. Mm -hmm. So the first 500, I was just trying not to like hyperventilate and then um, ruin it for everyone. So <laughs> I didn't. I didn't really look. <laughs> so um, we wanted to get the speed data from World Rowing, but World Rowing has uh, changed its website, so we couldn't get to the data. So please remember that. So they are 0.6 seconds down on the. Germans at 500 meters and now this is 1000 meters so you are up on the Germans 0.3 seconds so you gained on them uh, almost a you you gained them on them almost a second through this 500 so it just clicked or what did you do I mean I, I mean I think a lot of people think of rhythm as coming from the stroke but it actually comes from everybody all at once and I specifically remember in this race at the thousand, Tracy Iser, who's in two seat, who rarely speaks, uh, said, we're going to win this race. And I think she sensed as well that we had fallen into a rhythm that was fast and that could push us away from the field. Um, and if you're, if you're in a, if you're in a rhythm like that, everybody knows it. And so I think we all sense that we were doing the right thing. So when that's happening in a race, you just have to try to repeat that stroke over and over and over again. And then, you know, hope that those add up to, you know, inches over the other crews. And now, you know, in the, in the preparatory talk, you said that, you know, you know, U.S. team is overstroked. But I looked um, at all the stroke data I could find. I mean, in this race, you actually were always overstroked by the Polish. And you actually, you know, you didn't have the highest stroke rate. You always had the highest speed, but never the highest stroke rate. So it just felt good. Or... Uh, yeah, I think another thing to remember is we were kind of all novice scholars. The bow seat, it was her first race. Um, it was my second world championships sculling, my only time stroking Tracy's second mm -hmm. world championship sculling. Like we're not skilled enough to go down the race in a quad at a 39 um, and I'd like to rate higher, but that's just not possible. But fortunately we're strong enough that we can rate lower. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's just kind of where it ended up. I, we've never done a race, you know, like you're not gonna go down the race course at a 38 if you've never done it in practice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I think in one of the warmups, I couldn't even make the rate go above a 30, so. <laughs> 
So um, then here is 1500. So you have, you know, three quarters of a length on the Germans at a thousand. So you just, you never slowed down. I mean, you never slowed down. You just kept going, kept going, kept going. It was it's really amazing. So, it, so now you knew you have it or how, you know, what? Yeah, I think, you know, something people say about athletes is when you're like in a high pressure situation, time seems to slow down and you can think super clearly. And that's one of those instances in this race. And I remember looking over and seeing that we were up and thinking, I just want to get to the finish line. Um, but mm -hmm. when I started to do that, I started to row really poorly. Um, so I just thought like we have so much, it, feel, it felt like a lot more than this in my head. And I just thought, well, if I take one good stroke now and then another good stroke, you know, just staying present is really important um, when you're up or down. And so I think, you know, if that's a piece of advice I could give everyone, it's like, no matter what your situation is, you really need to focus on getting the most out of the stroke that you're on because you have no control what can happen in the future or what you just did. And so I think, you know, that's something that really stands out for me in this race. Mm -hmm. So the Germans couldn't catch up. So this is the finish line, you, you crossed first. And um, if I remember, if I'm uh, have done my research correctly, this is the first sculling gold medal of a U.S. women's te women's team, correct? Uh, I think so. I think so, but there may have been a light women's quad that got okay. gold. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not sure, but yeah, I think it was. It's definitely in a very long time. <laughs> and you, I mean, you held on to it. The Germans are, I mean, are furious on the sprint, and they couldn't catch up more than a, a seat or so. So you did really, really well. And then, um, so to show that US rowers are, you know, even people who win um, world championships are mortals too. I mean, then this happened, correct? Yeah, yeah, super big, <laughs> big crab right at the finish. But fortunately, we'd already crossed the line, so it didn't matter. <laughs> so, um, so you say, for you, the rhythm was, I can trust the people behind me and they pick, they, they do, they, what did you say? The slide and the drive. Yeah, the for me, I, I feel that the rhythm is good when there's no resistance coming up the slide or through the drive and it's everything moves freely. And mm -hmm. when I'm in the stern of the boat and that's my sensation, I know that we're doing everything together. And for me, there are many different rhythms that are successful, but um, they're only successful if everybody's doing them at the same time. And that's my indicator as a rower that we are all doing the same thing. And, and the, the Cambridge eight in the boat race was the same feeling. I'm yeah. feeling, you know, it's interesting because you pulled up a quote from Robin Williams and he came and coached us for a couple days at Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And I thought his ability to describe rhythm and describe how a stroke could feel was kind of unsurpassed by any, I don't know, anybody I've ever heard speak about rhythm before. So I think, you know, if you ever have a chance to listen to him talk about a stroke, you should, because he's, you know, called yeah. a wizard of rowing. But yeah, so that's a similar thing. Diff the rhythm is definitely different than how you wrote the U.S., but when everybody's doing it the same way, it's, it's free, it's loose, and there's no resistance. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, Andrew, of course, the challenge is now out you know she says she said that hey, uh, robin williams can explain it so this is yours i'll give it i'll give it a crack anyway and see how we go okay um, uh, stop sharing yeah so i i click share screen now is that what i do or is there someone else doing that for me no, there it is. you do it you do it. okay um share screen share beautiful I've got it. Okay, so rhythm in rowing. I, I, look, I, I like Felix's quote. I, I put it a different way. It's something that's defined and created. It has to be defined and created. And I suppose uh, I would well, reflect the importance of that in just how much time our crews spend in the pre-row briefing and the post-row debriefing discussing what the rhythm should feel like and how they're going to create it or how they're going to achieve it. And then post row, you know, analyzing the parts of the row where it was really sweet and what they wanted and where the reasons for 
perhaps having a, a fairly ordinary row. Rowers will put a, a tremendous amount of emphasis on this whole definition of what rhythm they want and how they're going to set about creating it. So I think it is very important for rowing and rowers. If you want a clinical or a formal definition of rhythm, the dictionary will say it's usually got a, a flow to it and some fast and slow movement. And it's the way these things interact and contrast that gives you rhythm. So in music, if you have a waltz, it's a one, two, three, one, two, three, one. So it's the, the emphasis on the first beat and, and the contrast between that and the second, that third, that gives you flow or rhythmic uh, rhythm to the music. If you're talking about ice skating, it's the push and then the glide and the push and the glide off one foot and then the glide on the other foot gives you the same kind of contrast between a fast and a slow movement. And rowing fits nicely into that kind of definition of a rhythmical pattern where you've got a continuous flow from the catch to the finish, but you have a contrasting fast and slow movement pattern to that particular movement. So I think, you know, rhythm in rowing is what makes it attractive. It's what makes it aesthetic. It's what we all, or spectators, love about rowing. It's that lovely, smooth, flowy motion that you see at, in top class crews. Um, so rowing is a repetitive fast flow of movements, uh, which when done, when done well, looks smooth, continuous, and definitely unhurried. Faster movements start at the catch with the placement of the blade and continue through to the finish. And of course, the slower movements begin as the hands move over the knees and continue up to the next stroke. That's the glide part of it. So that, that's the actual sequence that we're looking for. Effective rhythm. The essence of good rhythm for me is the contrast between those fast and slow movements. And when it's well executed, it will look smooth, continuous and unhurried. As Olivia was saying, it, it, it feels effortless when you get it right. And often, you know, the athletes will describe that feeling as good rhythm, as moving in unison and, and an effortless, effortless flow. There's lots of ways they describe it when you listen to them chat. But normally that, that effortless flow is generated during the drive phase of the stroke. You know, that you, you generate momentum and then that the hands are carried around the back turn and, and move away from the body while the, the seat sits still. You know, that, that kind of flow and momentum starts at the back there. You switch off any tension as the hands come away and then the movement of the seat forward down the side is significantly slower generally than, than what it is in the drive phase, unless you're at real full race pace. So I think it's important to understand what's happening there. The key for me to good rhythm is the execution of the turning points. You know, if you've got a men's eight, you've got 800 kilos, moving from the release point in the wrong direction to the boat run or the opposite direction of the boat run into the front. So the way you change direction at the catch is really crucial. And, and that to me is, is the key to executing good rhythm. If you can get that change of direction at the catch right, and then again at the back where you're actually moving with the boat and then you have to suddenly stop, flow around the back and, and move in the opposite direction. Uh, if you get those two turning points right, you, you're, gonna, you're on well on the way to getting some good rhythm in your boat. Ineffective rhythm, or poor rhythm as the athletes will say, is usually described by the athletes as feeling really heavy and unsustainable. And I think, you know, if you've ever rode, you've always, or you, you recall many races where, where it just was just hard work all the way down. Felix tells me it's... 90% of his races are feeling like this. So uh, we've got some work to do on you, Felix, but don't get too disappointed, Felix. I, I'm, I'm a believer in the fact that you can teach rhythm to athletes. So we'll see how we go during this talk. Um, it's usually, poor rhythm is usually the result of inaccurate catch and finish timings or application of power or different recovery tempos. That, that's what uh, creates poor rhythm. I think you'd probably also need to understand at, at a more senior level, even if the catch timing and the release timing look good and the bodies are moving well together, the rhythm can still be poor. Um, so at my particular level, I, I know I've experienced in some of the you know, Australian eights of the last few years, even the ones that win medals. Um, if the foreman places 
in time with the other boats in the crew, but loads too quickly, the guys around him feel like they can't get a grip and then they can't lead her. So the way in which these guys apply power and when they apply power, which you can't as a coach necessarily see, is really important to the, what they feel in the boat. Now, I'm sure Olivia will back that up. You know, if you, if you change the, the, the lineup slightly and all of a sudden, you know, there's a better feel in the boat. It moves better, it runs better. And, you know, it's not always observable from the outside, but it's what they feel in the boat itself. That it, and that's usually got to do with how you apply power and when people are applying and is someone taking the load off other people or, or getting on a bit too early or working the back, back turn too fast that just destroys the platform off the release. Someone pulls the finish in a little harder than the rest of the crew, it's going to pull it down on their side or throw it over the other side. So again, you destroy the rhythm by loading at different times. So I think that's important as well. So teaching rhythm, you know, I think you start off as a coach knowing that some people are born with much better kinesthetic awareness or we call them feel athletes and they find it easier to manufacture rhythm than other crew members. Um, and they usually find their way to the stroke seats, these kind of guys. Um, their ability or their neurological system is just a little more advanced and it allows them to flow through the recovery and drive phase with well-sequenced movements that others sitting behind them tend to follow easily. More than that, they also have a, the ability to connect and release the water effectively, and they kind of know where the impulse should be when the, when the drive is on. You know, I've got one guy I'm thinking about at the moment who we use as a stroke quite often. He, he's only pulled six minutes on the erg, but he can, we can put him in a pair with a 545 guy, and the pair will go straight. He kind of knows where the impulse should be, and, and, and he's in the stroke seat, remember, the stronger guy's in the bow seat, but he still holds the boat straight. So these guys that have good feel know where the impulse should be and can do it really effectively. Um, when you are teaching rhythm, I think there are three areas that you need to work on. The first of the areas is the ratio, the drive to recovery ratio. So these are the drills that I would use to work on that ratio part of it. Power strokes, where you really emphasize the drive phase and then you take your time in the recovery. So normally we do power strokes with a band and at low rates, you know, occasionally we do it at higher rates, but basically it's lower. So you're overemphasizing that ratio of drive to recovery. That teaches that push and then the relaxation and the recovery. So with, with, with a band, you mean the bungee cord around the boat or what's... what's yeah, bungee yep. cord around the boat or a toe, yeah. you know, it just... It, it emphasizes ratio, as well as developing the strength side of things as well. Acceleration drills do the same thing, where you place at a 0% pressure and you build to 100% through the, through the back, to the finish. So you really ex, you know, emphasize accelerations. People use sonics, such as getting the crew to count aloud. So again, you count 1,000 at the catch, emphasize the 2,000 at the finish, and then 3,000, 4,000 up the slide. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. So you can talk in sonics, the cocks can speak in a rhythm. Coaches will use um, cue sounds like chip, sha, chip, sha, like the coxes do. But that teaches ratio, you know, light catch, firm finish, push, drive. Um, and also the athletes need to tune into the, the wheels and, and they can feel the, or can, you can hear the wheel you know, accelerating back and then rolling forward quietly, accelerating back and rolling. There's a sound that's right when the rhythm is right. So you can, these are all aids to improving your ability to feel and, and, and generate ratio in the boat. So that's probably the first of three areas that I would focus on if I'm trying to teach rhythm to a crew. The second area, of course, is the boat run. That's the recovery. So we're off the drive now, we're on the rec recovery. And that's about moving the body parts in a well-ordered sequence without any tension and not disturbing the boat, which is running in the opposite direction to which you're moving your body parts. So strikes, I don't know whether you call it strikes, but it's what we call it in Australia. It's just, you know, basic stationary movement, starting with the blade buried at the finish. You just tap down and reach out and roll forward to the catch and put the blade in. You don't take a stroke. 
So that's about posture, it's about moving control and it's about relaxation. It teaches you to sit still, quiet and move quietly without disturbing the boat. Pause rowing, you know, basically does the same thing. It, it allows you a point in time where you stop, whether it be at the release or half slide, quarter slide. And you can take some time then to, to feel the relaxation and feel the boat movement underneath you. So the develop, that's the last point. They're developing that awareness of the boat running out underneath and, you know, also rising and falling. If you're sitting in the bow seat of a, a heavyweight men's eight, it goes up and down pretty large or a big distance. You know, the bow, bows really move up and down. So you, you, you need to be aware of that boat feel and developing as an athlete your ability to, to feel the boat run and move. Eyes closed rowing obviously emphasizes that same sensation of boat run, allows you to develop that dead light, dead slow rowing does the same thing where you put no pressure on and you drop the rate right back. And you know, if you really want to take some of those um, sensory input information out, then do some night rowing, you know, or, or blindfold rowing. It makes things a lot harder, but all of those kind of drills will, will you know, teach boat feel and an awareness of boat run, which is important if you want to get the rhythm right. So the final part of um, teaching or coaching rhythm, I think is what I mentioned earlier, is that catch and finish skill, the change of direction, which for me is just absolutely vital, you know, and in this area, um, are some of the drills like the push pulls where you start at half slide and then you bury the blade in squared position and you push forward and then just load yourself off the foot stretcher at the change of direction so it's a push first and then you just let the boat movement hold and you get that suspension off the foot plate if you know what I'm saying. Strikes which is that stationary exercise where you add the drive phase to it. Mm -hmm. Firstly in one strokes and then go strike and two, strike and three, strike and four. That will also um, teach you skillful change of direction at the front, front, you know, the catch area. That's, Building off the front. Sorry. I mean, just for interruption. So that's what in our club, everybody has learned to hate and love, love, hate relation. That's what we call the Australian good morning because mm. you taught me that one. So that's just... Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. the one. And, uh, you know, I was telling Felix, you know, in 10 strokes, you should, if you can do these strike plus 10, you should get close to a race pace split, mid-race pace split at the end of 10 strokes. It, it you know, it might seem unachievable at first, but with a bit of work, without pulling the side off the boat, you will actually develop really pure boat speed very quickly over 10 strokes doing, when you get efficient at these drills. Um, the next one there is building off the front. That's just sitting in the catch position, just for doing the first quarter, then take the blade out, put it in and do the first quarter again. Then take it out a little longer, come through to half and then take it out, put it back in at full, catch, full, full slide and, and then three quarters just build out from the catch. And then you do the same thing off the back, which teaches you the flow around the back to sit the body still, just do hands only, then hands body, then hands body quarter and build out. So these are basic drills that I think all rowers will do at some stage, but um, you know, that, that emphasize the catch and the finish change of direction. Early square helps you with the front end, delayed feather helps, you know, relax that inside arm when you're doing double square. All of these, you know, have their purpose in, in um, building the skill level for the crew at the catch and the finish. So, also, so they're the kind of the three areas that I focus on when I want to teach rhythm, drive phase, relaxation phase, and then the turning points, which actually ends the whole rowing stroke really, isn't it? I haven't really thought of it like that, but you, you've also got to get your crew to watch good rowing. Uh, you know, you, you'll, you'll see if, you, if they don't have a good mental picture of what rhythm you're striving for, what good rhythm is, um, then uh, it's very difficult for them to aim for it. So I would also show crews that, um, you know, I want them to look like in the end, uh, and that'll help maximise the improvement. You know, if you look at some of these crews, good aesthetic crews are not always um, the only fast boats out there. You know, there's plenty of crews like the Kiwi men's pair that won two Olympic gold medals like Spreckland's eight in 2008 that won the gold medal in the eight. 
that I would say aren't, aren't, aren't from the outside, they don't always look like there's a lot of flow there and, and, and very, a lot of rhythm. But there obviously is because they're all very fast crews and, and hold world records. So be careful that you don't just look for something that's athletically pleasing because I'm sure there's plenty of aesthetically pleasing boats out there that don't go very fast either. So I think a little caveat on that side of things. Um, the rhythm we're looking for is obviously something that is natural, not artificial or robotic, you know, and, and at this level, or at any level really, rhythm is a whole crew responsibility. So, and that gets back to that defining what it is and then setting about to create it, which Felix was talking about, or Robin Williams was talking about, you know, right at the outset of, the, of this chat. I'd close with just, you know, a little bit about flow. This is fairly new psychological phenomenon. Most of you probably would have heard about, but um, it, it's what, you know, surfers and skateboarders, when they're doing new tricks for the first time in the world ever, they, they say they often do them by chance. They, they're so immersed in their activity and uh, that they don't really think about it. It, it just becomes, it's almost an out-of-body experience for them. And they're so energized and, and in such great flow that the effort of concentration is not there and they can do a trick that no one else has ever done in the world. And in rowing, you know, I, I, I put that same kind of, I, ha, I have that same kind of sensation for crews that do really well and, and, and have that feeling of that um, Olivia was talking about where it's not hard, you know, they're, and it's not not even a mental effort for them when they get the rhythm right. It, it becomes just uh, an enjoyment and of uh, and a fulfilment of their you know, enjoyment, and it's just free speed if you like if you get it right. So if you can experience that so-called flow at regular intervals, you know, or, or regular and turn it on when you need to, that's probably the difference between a, a great crew and any crew. So I've probably prattled on enough there, Felix. So. I'll close it up and leave it to you. I have to pray for that. Thanks. So now to paraphrase what you said, in, in order to have good rhythm, you have to have good technique because you say you can't have the one without the other. Uh, that's an Australian view on it. But <laughs> I, did, I, I did point out that there are many crews that I admire like the Kiwi pair and like Spreckland's 2008 men's eight um, that obviously won gold medals at the Olympic yeah. Games that I, you know, I would not classify as particularly rhythmical or yeah. technical, but they go very, very quick. So they're obviously applying the load very well under the water or in, in whatever way they do. And they have a chemistry about them. It's not very often, Felix, that you find a pair that's made in heaven. Sometimes you do, and you know, where it just comes together from the second row, the first or second row. Normally, especially in the bigger boats, the fours now, we have to create it. And this is where I think rhythm is very teachable because, you know, I start off the every, beginning of every season with some pretty ordinary looking boats. But, you know, after six months of work, they can look pretty rhythmical and, and effortless, and, and many of them are very fast. So, I think it is a teachable thing yeah? and, and with a bit of focus, people could, could probably go a lot quicker than what they do. And, and you say, you know, there are the born stroke people. No and question. You... No, uh -huh. question. no question. I see them regularly. They just come into the program here and you say, man, that is, <laughs> he can, he's effortless. He just does it effortlessly. He just... I'll show you a new one if he comes over next year. You know, hopefully okay. get to Europe this year. He's, he's just very good. He's young black, 21. Just, uh, it's there. It's just somehow in, he's a, what I would call a feel athlete. You know, some athletes are good at catching balls and others are, you know, are good at aerobic base, good power. So, and then there's some of these athletes that just are good. They just know how to move their body in space and time. And, but I wouldn't get too worried too much about that because you need the other people in the crew with the other attributes. You need the big horsepower guys. You need yeah. the guys with the big VO2 max. So that's the beauty of trying to blend a crew. You know, you've got different, eight different people there if it's an eight and you, you've got to get the most out of all of them and find some synergy that mm. creates boat speed across the whole of all of them. Now I have, I have a question and I don't know whether I should ask it to you or, or Connie or afterwards because I mean, the example of Olivia um, 
put in the stroke seat four weeks before the race, basically using the championship as a training platform and only for the for the for the um, final actually getting together. There's this other example of the British quad in Sarasota where they actually had to replace the stroke on the way to the start, you know, because one was ill, they had to put the other one in. And both of both boats, as we saw, did extremely well. So you think there is a and also we have nothing to lose, let's go and try it. That helps, or is you know, is that just me, the outside look? Well, I'm not I'm not sure about Olivia, but I, I would hope that any any reserves we took to the world championships or Olympic Games have had enough time in the boat and would take it as their role to be as good as the person they're replacing. Uh, and at the top level, they usually are. So normally those people that you're talking about that you put in have been in the boat lots of times because okay. it would be reasonably unusual for us to be able to go through an Olympic campaign with the four and the eight and the pair all being in their boats with no injuries. When you've got 18 guys like that and they're all training, there's usually one or two off the water. So the reserves play a really, really important role. And uh, mm -hmm. certainly as a coach, I, I would expect the reserve to take on that responsibility. So to answer your question, if that person is in a good program, they will be well and truly prepared to go in the boat because we as coaches, always allow or we try and cover that happening that that occurrence which may happen you know in the last week or two weeks leading in i mean you know what happened to us last year well two years ago we had a heart attack two weeks <laughs> after an session. so you have to be able to put someone in two weeks before and still qualify you know or, or get a yeah. performance that's that so yeah okay thank you connie <clears throat> okay Oops, Wait, sorry. Oh, dang, it happens to the experts too. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, by now you Just must... looking for my, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, um, I think uh, it's uh, fascinating to listen to um, Olivia first and then afterwards um, Andrew just talking about rhythm, um, explaining speed, everything, you know, what we want to create in for a rowing boat. And none of them really has mentioned the word power at that point. Um, we obviously know that without power, we cannot really propel the boat hull. However, um, we need to find a synergy and a, a, a rhythm between the athletes, between the oars to actually make the boat move and fly through the water. So, um, yeah, it's um, also interesting just, you know, listening again to the to uh, just the wording or the explanation they've been using about what rhythm is for them, you know, like sensation, uh, sounds, skillful, feeling each other. I think it's all that soft, the, the soft skills we need for that. Yeah. Um, so um, again, I would like to refer to one of the um, phrases you've put in here from Catherine Granger. Um, I, I really liked of what she said, you know, what rhythm is for her. And um, if we now go to somehow our, um, you know, information or more objective information of what um, coach and athlete has explained so far, then um, I always like to start to say, to what do we want to do with the rhythm? So obviously just as, and um, Catherine Granger mentioned here in her phrase is we want to get as much recovery time as possible yeah in between the explosive strokes and um, so the other phrase I always love to um, use is that came always from uh, Reinhold Bacci in Australia and this is you win the race between the strokes and 
um, why, why would coaches say something like that? And for that, I would like to refer to my first little graph here where we see um, on the top left uh, graph a blue line which indicates the boat speed um, for any, any rowing boat. So of course a magnitude would be different between a, um, a small boat up to a big boat. But what we see is that we constantly have a fluctuation in boat speed. So the, um, you see here uh, for the blue line, you see the catch indicated. So the blue line here shows us that at the catch, the boat speed is never at its minimum point. The minimum point for every boat speed is just uh, the point uh, when we finally have the blades fully um, locked into the water. And then during every dry phase, our athletes need to um, obviously create impulse and power to be able to increase their boat speed through the dry phase. And we always see that throughout the dry phase, we always go through our minimum speed yeah, and our, min or our lower uh, boat velocities. And once we come through the, oops, sorry. Once we come to the, towards the finish, you can actually see that from the finish and then coming through the recovery phase, we are adding, actually hitting our highest speeds every stroke. So again, to create rhythm, what would be our aim? We want to use more time at the higher speeds, which is of course the uh, recovery phase. And we want to make our dry phase where we have to go through the lower end speeds of our boat. We want to make it as impulsive as possible so and powerful as possible. So we do not want to spend too much time through the dry phase. So how can we do that? Um, um, I just put a little um, sort of graph together. So for, for um, you to just sort of um, look through a couple of numbers, because I think it's always important that we sort of realize how rhythm is created. So obviously when we do all our low end uh, rating training from 18 upwards and then go up to our um, racing stroke rates, obviously the time per stroke we spend for a specific rate would be exactly the same for any crew. However, how we create the ratio between that time per stroke can be quite different. So if I look at the stroke of rate 20, that takes around three seconds and the uh, stroke rate of 30, which takes only two seconds, we see already that between these 10 different stroke rates here, we decrease the time per stroke by one second. How does it actually look like then when you go to the um, actual drive and recovery time? And that shows a crew that has been uh, very successful also in the women's squad. I thought I'd choose the same uh, boat class to where Olivia won that medal. So just sort of we stay in the same groove. Um, and you see here that for women, um, that successful quad spends around 1.18 seconds in the dry phase and 1.76 in the recovery at rate 20. When you go to the higher rate of 30, yeah, now we, the stroke is now one second shorter, but the ratio is quite interesting now. So you see that the drive time changes by uh, uh, or decreases a little bit by 0.24 of a second to rate 20. However, the recovery time shortens by 0.7 of a second. 
So that ratio you now have between drive to recovery time changes quite a bit. So that comes again to that uh, of what, um, you know, especially Andy sort of said, um, athletes need to, to learn to row together, feel each other, um, also have drills that they sort of understand the emphasis for the specific rates. Yeah, so you can actually see here just by what we see here in numbers, but the ratio of low rate between drive to recovery time changes at one point that our drive time is actually longer than the time we spend through the recovery time. And once this is happening, especially when that changeover comes at around a stroke rate 28.30, this is where it becomes quite hard for our crews that um, they need to learn that they go quite skillfully together through a shorter getting recovery phase to actually sit at the same position towards the catch again together to be able to go through another sort of explosive and, and powerful drive phase. So our recovery is a there to, you know, set obviously the rhythm um, for the stroke, but it's also the preparation time to be as skillful and as ready to be um, ready to, you know, place the blades and then um, be ready to go through the drive phase. If we do not understand the importance of A, the rhythm, but also of using the recovery skillfully, we often give our chances away to be ready and or for the next stroke and the beginning of your working phase, your drive phase. So how would that look like? So the... Um, the interesting thing is when you look through rhythm again, is that when we ex sort of just display numbers, of course, or show them through graphs, we should always remember, I just take a certain average here for a crew rhythm. But the crew rhythm in a quad, for example, indicates the numbers of eight oars. So that means eight drive times. And you can just see drive times here in numbers for P for port side of this particular quad um, and also for the starboard side. So you can see already that the numbers for their drive time. So from the beginning of the minimum angle to the end of the finish where they have, you know, their maximum angle it takes for one of the oars 0.92 seconds, for example, and the longest time another oar spends from minimum to maximum is 0.97 seconds. So again, that's also part of rhythm. How can that particular crew and combination manage to use the same time from the catch to the finish or you know, in moving in the same direction together. Same vice versa, of course, is what are they going to do through the recovery? So we have obviously a crew rhythm. In a quad, then you would continue. You also have a athlete rhythm between the right and left or. And then obviously you have your rhythm on one side versus, for, for example, you know, the port side versus the starboard side. So it um, can become quite complex when you want to teach rhythm. And I think it's quite important that the terminology you try to teach when you um, work on rhythm with the athlete, it's quite um, clear to the athletes of what they are aiming for. Um, because when we just, in this case, talk about numbers, you know, and the numbers say, okay, we are all within 0.04 of a second 
that's normally pretty good and we get a good rhythm out of that and fast boats. However, how are, do our athletes go actually through the speed um, and through that time in the dry phase and the recovery phase? So what we often do is instead of just using numbers, you know, and averages, I find it highly important that we also look at the quality of the movement patterns of our athletes, because it's a very good visualization tool for the athletes and also for the coaches to understand how well our crews can move together. So what I display here for that particular crew is um, that you see sort of these loops here. What they indicate is you see numbers one to four, which indicate the athlete's seat. And then on your left-hand side here, we see the four colors from black, red, blue, and green um, shows you that loop of um, the uh, starboard handle velocity and you see vice versa on the right hand side the handle velocity for the port side of that particular quad. So what are we trying to aim for? You see the zero here and on the x-axis so that shows you the handle speed and on the uh, uh, on the x-axis, we see the uh, stroke okay. lengths or the or angles. Yeah, so we would see that's at that smallest angle. That's your catch angle. Then we go in the positive numbers. All um, four oars move and increase handle velocity throughout the dry phase. We see that maximum handle velocity is reached. Um, around 10 degrees before the end of the dry phase and then all four oars um, decrease handle speed again to reach that maximum um, angle or the finish angle. Then of course you have that turning point that Andy talked about and how important it is to move together around the back end there. And then you go now in the opposite direction and visually quite easy too for us is you go from your maximum angle and now move through the recovery from your finish, tap down, hands away, and now through the recovery towards the next catch. So if our athletes move together, and the handles move at the same speed, then we would see an overlay of all colors and of these graphs together. And we see that in phases, in the dry phase, the athletes move really well together. We see separations, for example, on that starboard side a little bit on the finish and tap down position. It's not a big difference, but you see a little. Um, one reason for that too is that our athletes have different finish angles. But the biggest difference for that crew is the way how they approach that catch. So especially that person in black stops with the handle speed a little earlier. Interestingly, if your handle speed slows down coming towards the catch, of course, slower speed means you cannot reach the same catch angle as the others who had a more continuous handle speed forward and around the pin. When you look at the uh, port side, you see that they do that better together here in this particular case. So you can see there again, um, alone, the way of how they move in between the strokes and in their continuous movement pattern, that also sets the rhythm for the boat. And um, referring again to what um, Olivia said, um, when she said um, the best rhythm she feels is when there is no resistance coming through the slides, 
that is also that feeling of when we look at numbers or if we measure sort of seat speed or handle speed uh, of the athletes, then it would mean for us, the closer the movement patterns of our athletes on the handles, on the seats, on the backs are together, the easier they feel that movement together, they can create rhythm better and they roll longer, they have more time to get into positions and then obviously they are better prepared to take the next stroke. And this is um, for us, when we take measurements, that's quite easy uh, to see. And this type of feedback is um, visually um, a good indicator for coach and athlete where or like how well the athletes are doing it together and where are areas of improvement. Um, obviously, um, coming back again to what Andy also said is, um, different crews create different rhythm, yeah? So I have here two quads, men's quads now. First thing is when you look at the uh, um, numbers of ratios between drive and recovery time, it's quite, uh, it's a little bit different from women to men because obviously women haven't got the same amount of power. So they normally spend slightly longer through the drive phase. So they always have a little bit less ratio for the recovery time. Um, but even looking between a men's quad that is already in the, like a finalist in the men's quad, but if you compare the ratio between a finalist to a multiple successful medal winning crew, and also a, a Olympic medal winning crew, then you can actually see that the medal winning crew has in these different rates, um, less time in the drive phase and they have more time available in the recovery phase. And uh, for me, that is always a good indicator when we look for ratios and rhythm and how crews can create them. Um, and I just highlighted that for you, for example, for that um, stroke rate 28, for example, yeah. So it, it just gives you a little bit of an indication of, um, you know, how can crews gain more speed, even though that one crew maybe has, is uh, actually more powerful. But if, for example, if I have a crew that has over 100 strokes, um, for example, where they have every stroke point of a, point 0.1 of a second more time in through the recovery and can spend that in the higher speed range, of course, for them, it's easier to hold speed and the high speed easier yeah, and go faster. Um, again, uh, interesting here too is when you look at actually the handle speeds between these two crews, you would maybe think, oh, the handle speed actually for the finalists looks actually better um, in the way they move together. What is actually the big difference? And um, the difference between the crews here is that the medal winning crew had at this time still differences in their finish angles. That's why we see different shapes of speeds around the back end. So even though that finish angle wasn't set perfectly at the time, by the time they came um, closer and closer to the racing, um, the coach would have adjusted their positioning um, a bit better and sharper. So that speed gain would even get better. Yeah, but coming through the recovery and setting the timing towards the catch, it was sort of flawless for that particularly um, medal winning crew. But um, I guess that's sort of what, um, you know, Andy also mentioned is different crews can create speed 
and rhythm differently. And um, that obviously doesn't always need to mean that they all look aesthetically perfect. It's how the timing is also and how they are able to, you know, um, initiate power and force together. It's a highly important point. Okay, so, um, and then the other thing too is, and that's uh, always for me uh, important to mention is, and uh, again, you know, we sort of mentioned rhythm, how do you coach it, how do you, um, what else do you gain actually from good rhythm? And uh, again, Olivia mentioned, you know, that you don't feel the resistance. Um, so when you come into a big boat, it's, um, and, and Andy, uh, we've worked a lot on that as well, is, you know, figuring out how your athletes are actually moving, A, as an individual, you know, and in this case, again, I use the handle speed. Here I show that to you for a women's aid. So what we found for that particular women's aid at one stage was that um, even though it was a... Um, medal winning crew when they were in a racing situation their catch angle was always quite short and um, so when we look at the catch angle here for these eight particular graphs we can see that on average the catch angle was minus 53 degrees for this particular level of rowers we expect them to row a minus 55 minus 56 degrees um, but we couldn't get there with this particular crew. So what did we actually notice is it wasn't the power at that time that was missing. It was the missing rhythm or that missing crew rhythm. And one reason where the rhythm fell apart was their idea of how they were moving uh, their bodies and also the handles from the finished towards through the recovery towards to the catch and we see that the lines through that mid recovery are very different so athletes actually um, sometimes get quite a different understanding of how are they supposed to move through the recovery towards to the next catch and for example that person in orange here is the stroke of that particular boat. And you can see that there is a hesitation point. So um, the stroke was moving quite smoothly from the finish through the first half of the recovery phase. That was all fine. But then the speed slowed down and then she created the second speed. So she went over the knees, had the hesitation and went again. So the athletes behind constantly had to react to that particular rhythm. So that stroke actually never realized for a while that she created the wrong rhythm for the athletes behind because that is quite a difficult rhythm to follow. So she needed to understand and learn that the approach is really to have a one speed rhythm coming from the finish throughout the recovery forward. Once she was able to find that sensation of, you know, one speed, the athletes behind her also could follow much easier and were more in time with each other. So that took quite a while, but again, once the rhythm worked, it felt obviously better for the crew, but the positive gain they got from it was also that they reached a longer catch angle. And with a longer catch angle, they could get more work done per stroke and they had a much uh, better angle, a more effective angle to um, connect with the water and then initiate the force through the legs earlier. So you can see that rhythm obviously um, 
creates better skills to then be more powerful through your working or your drive phase. And um, going back from an elite level to our uh, younger athletes, um, again, when we start to look for, you know, you throw different athletes together in a boat and you want to see what is possible, then you can see um, that when you have eight athletes coming from different rowing programs, different skills and also different strength level, then they row quite differently together. And now that handle movement that gives us a good indication of how the rhythm looks like for a particular crew, you can actually really see that in the beginning it can look quite variant between the athletes and not just in the way of how much time they spend through the stroke and through the drive and recovery time, but also how long they can row with that. So if we have different movement patterns in a boat, you create um, often a limitation initially for the boat and what we see then is that when you look at the force profiles, especially at the catch, we see a lot of inefficiencies in the way our athlete can connect with the water and place a plate. Um, once the crew can create better rhythm, we will see straight away that on the handle speed, they move or the, the loops merge closer to one loop together. And once that is created, athletes have a much better chance to um, initiate earlier force through the, um, through the early part of the drive phase and get more work done per stroke. Yeah, so uh, this is, um, I guess just sort of the objective side of what um, Olivia and and Andrew have explained, you know, beautifully of what rhythm can actually create towards speed and how important these fine skills of our athletes are to be able to um, maintain fast speed and hopefully make it first over the line. Um, so yeah, that sort of, I would leave it here for now, and then maybe there's more in the discussion. So, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, so let's go to the questions. And so... Um, One question, or do we just, Jessica, you have to help me. Do we just open up and let people ask questions? That sounds because, good, yes, that sounds great. So, the, because there is one question here that from Pat Tyrone, mm -hmm. have coaches switched athlete seats every often based on your objective data, Connie? So do they use your data to actually <laughs> switch people around? Okay, Andy is smiling. So the answer is most probably yes. <laughs> <laughs> is Andy answering on me? Um, yes, we definitely do that. And um, I have worked a lot with Andy. So Andy knows uh, my approach is also, it's not just a black and white situation. As I mentioned to you before, it's... Um, Obviously, certain graphs and numbers help us to understand, to see the strengths and sort of the weaknesses of, of the crew or, you know, also the opportunities of how we can get better. And um, there is, as uh, Andy mentioned before, too, you... Um, data often supports of what a coach sees anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, we often then use the information to sort of make sure that the decisions can be made easier and um, in more, more thoroughly 
to sort of understand why a switch could actually help us to, um, to get that next um, level uh, of speed for the crew faster, yeah, or the next technical level that we want to reach faster. And yes, we obviously um, use information to put athletes in particular seats. But um, when we think of the way how, you know, especially your collegiate system uh, goes that the athletes are supposed to learn to row nearly every seat that has a lot of advantages too. In the end, the data often supports also um, where your athletes end up. Yeah, so even though your athlete maybe rows once a stroke seat and then another day is a two seat, um, the data often uh, would suggest to put that athlete into that particular seat where the neuromuscular systems often sort of um, would put him anyway. Yeah? So you have people who are really good in creating speed um, or being very impulsive with the legs. Others are the workers, you have them more in the middle, and then you maybe also have very skillful athletes who can really hold that finish. And if you have one of them, they often end up in the bow of the boat. Yeah. So um, obviously there are, it's good to have athletes for different seats available. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Connie, in, in, in the preparatory meeting, you said that you know, if they are not together at the finish, it's really hard for them to be together at the catch. And of course, to 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 get them to um, be patient at the finish, or you know, whatever the right word is, mm -hmm. so that then they can move. Like this one example you had, where the where the stroke slowed down, and then you know, all of a sudden felt them coming back from behind, and then she sped up again into the catch. Of course, if they were together at the finish, they might not have done that. So how, Andy and, and Connie, how do you teach people how a good finish feels? You know, I mean, there is this one picture of, of Olivia in uh, on the screenshot. I mean, their finishes weren't very good because you, you know, you see where their blade is in that one picture. So how, how, how do you coach a good finish? How do you coach finish, pull in mountain, then come out of it and then be together? How do you coach that? <laughs> we are struggling. <laughs> I guess when we come to coaching, I guess uh, Andy is always the one who has got sort of more the, the skill of explaining that. Coming from a biomic point, um, we can definitely uh, say that a good finish um, needs to be created by a uh, making sure that we set up the athletes properly for a good finish. So we try to, you know, have a proper finish angle for them. Um, however, that sort of positioning of athletes is just one is a point. The other one that is highly important is that our athletes have a good posture towards the finish. So, you know, getting the sequencing right, but also trying to sit up at the finish, handle height needs to be right. And it always helps that our athletes put a bit more emphasis on that finish in the way of trying to stay connected with the stretcher while sort of assisting that finish positioning by um, activating the glutes a little bit towards the finish. If we have a good posture at the finish, then it's much easier to also find that finish point together. If I weak, if I lose my contact point to the stretcher, um, then of course it's much harder to move together around the back end. Because the, the only fixed point in the boat is our stretcher. So if we lose contact to the stretcher, 
we actually don't really have contact to each other through the boat because the blades are then out of the water, the seat is moving, the handles are moving. So um, it's much harder to feel each other and that again would affect rhythm. But how to teach us, I get Andy is ready to mm -hmm. give you a good clue there. And <laughs> exactly. Um, so Felix, I, I think if you're having problems at the finish, uh, you'd probably break it down. I think Connie's point about posture is really important. You've got to kind of try and feel yourself sitting up out of the hips so that your, your posture is, is tall, because I think Connie made a very valid point. The minute you come onto the front of your foot at the back there, you've lost it. You've gone over and back and behind. Then you have to dig yourself out of that finished position, which it, depending on how strong you are, it takes a lot of different times. So you, so first, the key point about the finish is do some feet out stuff where you actually keep the soles of your feet on the foot plate because that, that's then you're all connected to the same point. You know, when you have your feet in the shoes, it's easy to fall back and underneath the handle and then, then you've got to dig yourself out and it, we just don't want that feeling at all. Probably the other thing to, to, to remember with, with that back position is that you want to get a feeling that you drive slightly uphill on the way back. So from the front to the back, you actually go uphill a centimetre. You don't, you don't come down into your hips, you actually drive slightly upwards. So the athlete, although they're coming back and swinging, they want to feel like they're going up in the boat, off the bow. So they're not loading the bow with their body weight, they're actually squeezing back and slightly up and staying in contact with the foot plate, with the soles of their feet. So that's probably the key. And you can do that on an ergometer as well. If you watch the erg, people erging, and you see them pull back on their toes, they've probably gone too far back. They've lost that connection with the, the foot plate on the ergometer, which is the same in the boat. You know, you need to have that feeling of driving slightly uphill. You need to be connected to the foot plate and you need to be out of your hips. And that gives you a solid finish point posturally to work the timings. So once you get that finish point posture good, then you can start thinking about how or the handle speed down and around the back, what speed you're going to flow out. And a lot of that's determined by the momentum of the draw in. So unfortunately, it's just all the cycle. Um, but if you squeeze the finish together, then normally the hand will flow around the back and down and out at a natural speed anyway. And people can lock into that and feel that. So um, I think getting the posture right certainly fixes a lot of the issues. Then you can focus on handle speed, how much the tap is, and the drills to do that, of course, you know, just hands only, hands body, you get those kind of drills that actually teach timing and, and movement pattern around the back. So, yeah, and Felix, yeah. I hate to say this, but I have to be on the water in five minutes. Okay, so, good. That's so good. I'm going to have to... Okay. I'm going to have to go. It's not the right time in Australia um, for, for bedtime. There's another two sessions yet. So okay. anyway, Good. So I'm Thank really you. sorry about that. But I'm happy to answer any questions if you email them to me. And, uh, uh, you know, certainly you, you can have the notes as well if you want. The people want the notes that, from, that I put together last night. That's fine as well. So, But Thank I really apologise to everyone. But I do have to go. So Good. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank Ciao. you. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we, yeah. I, um, I, have, I have a question, Connie, which, which is bothered. So we have, um, I mean, in the club, we have issues with the finish. Um, and we have done some arms-only racing. Just, I mean, to see what happens. Um, the differences are huge, of course. And I have a, a problem I can't explain. We have one guy tall guy, 6'4", strong, heavy. Um, and he claims he can't, I mean, he's fast. He, he's, he's one of the faster ones in arms only. But he claims he doesn't feel his feet. He doesn't feel pressure on his feet. How, how can that be? <laughs> how can that? Because the rhythm, he gets, you know, once he understood that he also has to have rhythm arms only, I mean, it's not... How quickly can you get the blade in again? It's also, you know, even if arms only, it's only let it run, decide when you do the next one, so on. He claims he doesn't feel the feet. Um, there are different ways, and I guess Olivia could also um, give feedback on that. Um, 
we have different types of athletes in the way they are using the dry face to push through the foot stretcher. Um, you have athletes who do the typical uh, coming from the toes and then pushing down towards the heels. These are our athletes who normally feel more connected through the stretcher. And for them, it's often also easier to hold that finish. Um, and then we have um, athletes who are more toe pushers and we find more of them in the, um, in the sculling. And um, athletes who often um, have lots of back issues. So um, that uh, if athletes stay mainly on the, on the toe, and then come towards the finish, they often then lose contact to the stretcher because they're only attached with the stretcher to the top of their uh, shoes. And this is of course a much smaller um, area. You can still be attached to the stretcher. Um, if you are able to hold your connection with the stretcher on the top third, even though you prefer that feeling of just being on the toes, um, the less area that is in contact with the stretcher, the harder you can hold that finish. And of course, um, you don't then feel it. Okay, yeah? so that's, that's the reason um, he just doesn't. Yeah, but so, so the easiest way, if you want to see um, who finds it easy to connect or hold that connection to the stretcher and who finds it, you know, not simple to, to get that sensation of are they connected. Um, just row on the ergometer uh, without shoes and just follow that, that pattern of the foot while they are rowing. You know, not think about it, just hop onto the ergometer and see how the, uh, the foot is moving. And that gives you actually a good indication of, you know, the type of athlete um, or oh, the way that particular athlete, uh, let it be master, rower, be, uh, mm -hmm. beginner, elite, doesn't matter. You just follow the pattern of the, the, fo uh, the foot and you understand how they are initiating and uh, pushing through the stretcher. Yeah? Okay. Because it's sort of like a signature. We do that on the ergometer, very similar to how we do it in the boat. Yeah, and, uh, so so Olivia could sort of, um, you know, maybe you want to say something there, what you feel on the stretcher, um, because that's, of course, a, a key point of how we can generate speed. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I think I can actually relate to this. I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions in the chat talking about, you know, drills that you do or how, you know, what you do during training when you're stroking a big boat to get the rowers to follow you in rhythm. And it's interesting because my experience rowing in the UK, everybody's focused on the finish. Um, whereas I've, you know, throughout my rowing emphasized the catch and how my hand or my, my feet feel through the catch. And, you know, as long as I feel connection with the footboard around the finish, I'm quite comfortable. Um, but to me, the rhythm is created in the first half of the drive. And so to answer Volker's question, um, you know, how do you generate rhythm? It's, it's top quarter legs only drills. Um, and I find that those are the most helpful for big boats to get everybody on board. And if you can get that connection, you know, squeeze your core heels down to get connection, it brings the, it brings the connection down low and that's something you can hold through the finish. If you don't get it at the catch, it's really hard to feel connected around the finish. And so, you know, I think they obviously feed into one another, right? Mm -hmm. um, we should circle, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, I. For me, the catch is the important part of uh, rowing. And if I ever feel like the crew is having a tough time matching up, I think that's the first, that's the first drill I would go to. And it's really slow and it's deliberate and it's super light, um, you know, almost no pressure, but making sure, you know, look at your blade, fully buried, then you step. And that's, you know, that's critical, I think, for establishing a good rhythm. Okay, what the other question? You, you, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I see. Uh, the other thing that I thought was really interesting listening to Connie is, you know, in your in the boat as a rower, 
you're accelerating the handle throughout the drive and you come and you finish and you think the boat's moving fastest there, but you know, it was enlightening to hear Connie say, it's actually, you know, as you're coming up the slide, that's when mm -hmm. the boat's moving fastest. And, you know, I, rowing, you say sometimes time on the slide is time wasted. It's like the funny thing we ever say, right? Um, you know, the rhythm I've been experimenting with, you know, time at the finish versus time up the slide, it, it almost to me doesn't, it doesn't really matter. But, you know, I think of times when the boat's moving fastest at high rates, you have to come around the back end pretty quickly. And I almost feel like you give yourself a little tug on the top of your shoes and that pulls you up to catch. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, a lot of people try to go really slowly up the recovery. And I actually think that that's kind of wrong because when you're moving slowly, you're not maybe moving freely with the boat. When you're up at race pace, uh, the boat's moving very fast and the slide will be fast. And it's all about coming up, being prepared, dropping that blade right in. Um, and I think sometimes the mistake is people go, oh, well, there has to be a lot of time on the slide. And obviously the boat's moving fastest there, but um, you have to move with the boat on the slide and on the recovery. And I think that's better way to think about the recovery as opposed to, oh, I want to, you know, have a certain, you know, one, two, three, four kind of counting um, method. But I think to establish the, the rhythm initially, that's a really great way to do it. I think what you just said just hits for me the, um, the you know, the nail. It's um, just when you said, you know, that having time on the slides. It's just when coaches sometimes say that in the right way, you know, to the athletes. Athletes, I've noticed that athletes can interpret that exactly the opposite way. You know, when I showed that stroke with that two speeds, yeah, coming towards the catch in the recovery, she interpreted in the way that she needs to slow down and then because she wants to give herself time but the coach was actually meaning you know we want to have the time so move in one speed forward towards the next catch so you actually have time with the crew to place you know the next catch so you can actually be more effectful um, effective at the next catch but with her slowing down in the middle of the recovery she took actually time away so it, it it's just um i find it fascinating how our terminology is sometimes misunderstood and not out of any wrong reasons it's just i think we need, really need to make sure that we communicate properly between coach and athlete so we actually have that same meaning um, because I, I have noticed that more and more that um, that one voice of the coach can mean different ways to the athlete. Eat different things to the athlete. And that's in a different rhythm, yeah? If you have different understandings of how to move, you don't have one rhythm, you have different rhythms in within one crew. Mm -hmm. And then, sorry, there's just this other question. Uh, how do you find, uh, how do you, rhythm is better developed by having crews rolling longer steady state pieces or by, or shorter versus shorter pieces? And um, I personally, I don't know, I'm sure coaches feel differently, but I actually think full pressure pieces anywhere from a 22 to a 26 really help define a rhythm because um, I think looking at kind of what Connie said, like, for a rower, the time in the water, maybe after like a 26, doesn't really feel like it changes that much, but it's the time on the recovery. So if you can make a drive feel good at those rates, all you have to do to get to race pace is just move your hands around the back a little faster. So I would say full pressure at a 20, 24 is my favorite way to establish rhythm. Um, but you guys might have different impressions of that. That's just as a rower, those are, those are the pieces I find most helpful. We'll try. <laughs> uh, will interesting be. also would be the point, Olivia. Um, I don't know if that's a question there. I haven't looked. Um, when you want to learn rhythm, do you actually feel like that 
a lot of sort of good efficiency or effective rhythm can also be learned when fatigue comes in and you try to be more efficient or do you feel like that the um, you know learning good rhythm is um, better created once the mind is fresh in the muscle I think it's a, it's a balancing act. I would never say that it's beneficial to go out for a row when you're exhausted and tired and it's going badly and think that you can turn it around magically in the middle of a practice. I think I would rather cut a practice short if you're unable to um, you know, focus or exert yourself for that long and start fresh. For me, that works the best, but I also feel like um, when you're too fresh, you, uh, use little muscles when you're rowing that kind of take away from establishing a good rhythm. So a, a good amount of fatigue um, from like, you know, building up to a practice or a training session so that you can just focus on using big muscles, but being mentally fresh so that you can focus on every stroke being good. That's, those are the best rows that I, those are the best rows that I've had. I have a question, if I can chime in here. Um, how much do you think rhythm speed has to do with the chemistry of teammates in the boat? So assuming that's an element to your, um, what do you do to draw that out or cultivate it? Or is it sort of just left up to the crew members to sort of figure that out? Um, uh, I, I personally um, think that as an athlete, you've got two different personalities. You've got who you are when you're outside the boat and then you've got an athlete. And I actually think the most successful crews are the ones with the least amount of dialogue. And I think that, um, you know, I would say that on the US team, we don't speak very much or if we do, it's generally quite short and positive and we kind of communicate with our motion. And so you could take two teammates that don't necessarily uh, hang out that much together. You wouldn't consider friends and they move a boat great. Um, and so I think that, you know, rhythm, it's, you know, you decide what kind of rhythm you want to perhaps through speaking, but I think more effective than that is, you know, having one or two focuses and doing that and trying to communicate with your, with your action and your effort. And I think that, you know, um, too often, I think if you, you know, if you kind of discuss rhythm too much, especially while you're in the boat, you know, turning around mid practice, it, it gets a little muddled. And so, um, you know, I don't. The indications are we have to stop. Huh? Personalities necessarily. <laughs> Thank you. Did, did you think we should, are we ready to wrap up or should we continue with? Let's see whether there are questions. I, so I have another, if, if that works. Yeah. Um, how do you plan or train for extreme circumstances? So that influence rhythm. So potentially it's just the stressors around a particular event or, and or it's the environmental conditions. How do you? I would say a really good, uh, I would say a, a really good way, or I, I guess I, when you ask that question, I think back to my time at Cambridge because you race on the tideway and you never know what's gonna happen on the tideway, right? So part of it's being mentally prepared, knowing that something bad could really happen and you have absolutely no control but then practicing for those situations, obviously like you can only be prepared as you can be. So, you know, we would practice catching a crab. So what do you do if you catch a crab? You know, we practice in tanks. Somebody catches a crab, this is what this person does. This is what this person does. So you wanna be all on the same page and prepare for every scenario. And then I guess when it comes to weather, like you can never have enough clothes, right? So always <laughs> pack food. And, and clothes, <laughs> but if you have food and clothes, usually everybody's gonna be all right. So like, you know, prepare mentally. If you can walk through a scenario, uh, you know, something adverse happens, do that. Because just going through it once, even if you just talk about it 
it'll make it so much easier when it's spur of the moment and you got to respond immediately. So I, yeah, catching a crab, I uh, can't really think of anything else that's bad that would happen. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure there's lots of things. <laughs> Yeah, one of the Cambridge crews almost sank, you know, I mean, you know, the, not yours, the one before, I think. Yeah, but in that scenario, they just, they, you know, it's whatever happens, you keep rowing, and then and they did it. They rowed oh, yeah. beside they... the boat, you know, bailed itself with the pumps, and yeah. then they continued, so I think they handled it pretty well. Oh yeah, they did very well. I mean, that was best advertising for women's rowing. I mean, every other every other team had stepped, and they just went on, and they kept going. I mean, that was amazing. Okay, thanks for your patience. Questions? Come on. I have, of course, no. Do you have a rhythm? It's better developed by having crews room longer than we I think we are through, huh? So, thank you very much for being patient, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, I uh, hope you got out of it what you wanted. I did. I uh, want to show one thing, just one thing, um, because I want to Connie to see it and uh, give her feedback about it. Um, where is it? Where is that damn thing? Here we go. Okay. Um, so. Um, <laughs> This, yeah, yeah, of course. This, so this drill, um, Andy mentioned this Australian good morning you do in the US, it's called placement drill. So you do 15 placements and then you take placement plus one stroke, so on and so on and so on. So we have been experimenting with this. Of course, we are um, confined to the single, um, unfortunately. Of course, it's a drill developed for big boats to make sure that the crews get together, but we do them in the single. And actually, you should, as, as Andy said, you should be able to um, accelerate uh, by placement plus 10 strokes. You should um, be able to um, be at race pace, race speed, or race speed and race pace. And what we see in our novices is, you know, they do really well till placement plus six, plus placement plus seven. Then they peter out and then placement plus 10, they actually come down. And to me, and this is the man, uh, the, uh, the woman does slightly better, but it's, it's the same thing. How do you teach rowers not to limit themselves? How, how do you, how do you get to the point where you let the rower go as fast as the boat wants to go. Because I can tell you, they can all row faster than what they did this, but basically at, at placement plus six or so, you see they all flatten out. So what's, what, how, how do you, you know, Connie, your thing is the moment they were together, they were longer. Um, the, how do you, let them go faster and not limit themselves. I don't know how to explain it. It's just. Um, does, do you want Olivia to answer first or? Whatever. Um, how do you get rowers to go hard? No, no, it's, <laughs> I don't think. It, you think it's going hard? You think they're just not going hard enough? No. Um, what the way I would interpret that is that um, you've got obviously the you've got sort of four trials yeah sort of these four steps in and the first three times you can see that their last stroke was the highest speed yeah so the mm -hmm. red one is their speed I guess yeah yeah um, and then you see in the fourth piece that suddenly you have that hesitation where the speed comes down. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that doesn't necessarily only needs to be that there, you know, that the, the exhaustion comes in already. Uh, but because it's such a high stroke rate as well, um, as, as we sort of showed already before, um, 
I think the skill level is often not there to repeat that movement exactly the same way over a continuous of, you know, 10 to 15 and then 20 strokes, um, especially in big boats. You know, you can often do and repeat um, a stroke, you know, for five strokes and then seven and but you really have to learn what comes after seven and then manage mm -hmm. to repeat it for 10 and so on. So it's, it's a skill they need to learn that the variation between stroke by stroke can stay as small as possible the longer that particular piece is. Because the longer you continue with your rating or with that piece, the more arrows come in. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a, it's a skill level as much. And, and as we said before, if the rhythm is good, they can create a powerful stroke. But once you fall out of your rhythm, even just slightly, you will see a drop in power and so then a drop in speed. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's most likely that repetition speed that, uh, or the repetition skill that this particular crew hasn't got. So here okay. you see um, they do that better, yeah? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's also mm -hmm. 15 years different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, I mean, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. good. But it's, um, yeah, it's just these little timing differences that come in. Mm. Mm. Okay, good, thank you very much. Thank you, thanks for everybody. It was a great. Yeah. It was a thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot for having us. <laughs> I owe <laughs> all of you, you a lot. I owe a lot of you. I learned yeah. a lot. <laughs> so, Connie, this is for you. You know, I mean, we don't have the fancy peach system, so we had to make ourselves. That so doesn't the... matter. Things work. Um, I guess yeah. one thing um, I, I was sort of thinking maybe uh, Olivia would mention it, but um, I guess. We all love numbers, you know, in rowing and cycling mm -hmm. and so on. And you often ask, why is the finish a, a, a hard skill to do well? And um, I think we created the weaker finishes ourselves in rowing a little bit because um, in one way, the, especially in winter and that, the ergometer is used a lot and because we get numbers from the ergometer, it's a good sort of comparison tool, a good fitness tool that shows you of what your physical capacity is. However, we also know that the ergometer um, gives you a positive power value by rowing as long as possible and often it comes with a very weak finish on the ergometer, but you don't get punished for that on the ergometer. So if I try to rip everything out of an ergometer and I know I gain good numbers from it off the water, of course, I often take the bad habit onto the water and that creates the weak finishes. We then try to sort of fight while you know, rowing on water or in a boat. So um, yeah. we have created that for ourselves a little bit um, in one way, loving the numbers from an ergometer, but um, the bad that comes with that is that it created a wrong sort of feeling of how a proper finish should, should be a taught and should feel like. Yeah. yeah, and that's, you know, that's what we did here. So this is a, the, one of those Empower Orlocks. It's head of the hooch. It's one of mm. the head races here. It's 5K. Oh, yeah. Mm. And he, I mean, he, he is in the 55 plus. That's, he, he, it's one of ours. He did the fastest time. But he sees how consistent he is at the catch and how much, you know, he's, he's really good at the catch. But at the finish, the moment he forgets to focus on the finish, he just washes out. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and we are now working on, uh, all of us, I mean, as a club, because that's our club weakness, mm -hmm. we are working on this. I mean, to, to actually 
I call it these Italian mountains, push these Italian mountains at the film. <laughs> so, because the Italians do it really, I mean, they do it beautifully. So that's where we, yeah. where we have issues. I mean, and but I think the yeah, moment- They often don't, they, it's the same with the French too, yeah? They often teach the catches quite differently to how, for example, the Americans would mm, teach yeah. catches, yeah? Or coach catches. Mm. Yeah. So, thanks. Thank can you. I can I ask a quick question? So you said at the beginning that Connie has been working with some of the technological changes that are going on. Is yeah. there anything particularly exciting uh, that, that that's coming? Mm. <clears throat> I guess people have a lot of ideas, but within FISA, a lot of ideas. Um, don't get allowed to be uh, used during FISA racing, yeah? Mm. So um, people try, you know, different type of grips or different types of um, blades, for example, want to put little slits and that in. And there's still the hesitation often within FISA to say, um, we want to keep equal um, opportunities and no sort of expensive equipment that would cause a rowing uh, community to constantly feel like they need to buy new equipment. Yeah. So with that, we often don't see much um, sort of um, equipment coming out within rowing. So there is nothing that is dramatically different that is coming out. So, you know, people want to put some little, um, yeah, as I said, the blades, maybe put some slits in uh, different uh, grips, which I think could be a good, um, um, also with different grips, um, just when you also think that sometimes if you have any, you know, pain in your wrists and, um, you overload your, or overload your forearms and that if you have different grips sometimes for training would be actually good but yeah so to make it short no there is nothing that is dramatically differently coming out small changes yes i think the interior of the boats are going to change uh, when we think of seat shapes stretchers um, you know, widths of stretchers, putting um, moving parts uh, on the on the um, on the uh, shoe plates, so we can actually um, we are able to move a bit more naturally through the through the feet, through the ankles, and through the knees. Uh, I'm a big fan of that too. We need to be a bit more individualized for our athletes, um, but. Um, also uh, grip, you know, width, of course, would be nice, especially for women that sometimes um, quite thick, you know, they, um, so, but, you know, that you think different materials on blades and that not really. Thank you. I was going to say I have quite big hands, so I like the men's grips. Yeah, you roll. Yeah, you you roll blue grips. I saw that. You know, I'm yellow. You blue. So yeah. My husband and I have the same ring size. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. That Thank you. Fun. Thanks. That was a really nice birthday present. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I'm sure you guys saw the chats, but you're getting thank yous from Kim and Pat and Christina and Steve and Volker and lots of folks. Okay, good. <laughs>